electricity, and more precisely, hydroelectricity, has been something that the Empire Club has talked about since we were first set up 112 years ago in 1903. In fact, it's easily one of this club's top 10 subjects of all times. There have been literally hundreds of speakers who have addressed this topic over the last century and a bit, and while the issues have changed dramatically over the decades, the importance of the topic to the local, provincial, and national economies has not. Now take, for example, one of the most memorable speeches from 1906, 110 years ago, when the chairman of Hydroelectric Power Commission, Cecil B. Smith, came to the club and addressed its members on, quote, the hydroelectric question. Now, back then, as you probably all know, Niagara Falls was the centre of the electricity universe, and it seemed that this form of energy was bountiless for all time. There was already good recognition that the industry was at the heart and soul of any successful economy. I'd like to just read you a brief speech, a brief uh, quote rather from that speech. We always try and put our guests in some kind of historical context. So here's what people were thinking about in the electricity universe in 1906. The distribution of electrical energy in a city is a great benefit. It is a natural monopoly. It should be done by one company, and the only question in your mind to decide is, do you decide to use your financial strength to go into the business for the sake of having that distribution carried on more cheaply than a company could carry it on? And it's self-evident that a company is there to make money and that a city, if it had the business, would be there to make the city grow. Therefore, that is the way I would like to leave it with you to consider, that there is an unlimited source of electrical power at Niagara Falls, that the use of that power throughout this peninsula will maintain its industrial position and strength, and I might say, if you do not use it, you will not maintain your industrial position. There are lots of towns and cities across Ontario that are into the business, uh, are into business, and they are going to have lots of electrical needs in the future for their manufacturers. And if their, if their manufacturers do not get that electricity, they will go elsewhere. I know of industries that are making preparations to move based entirely on the fact that they are going to get electric power, knowing that the city is going into the business of delivering electric power to its manufacturers. So anyway, obviously back then, very different context. The idea that electricity was endless, it was a, a resource that would never run out, but also that ultimatum that you better pay attention, folks, because if you don't do this, somebody else will and make a lot of money doing it. Toronto and the future GTA area certainly didn't elect to leave things as they were, <clears throat> and in fact became a huge producer and consumer of electricity. And over the decades, we faced each new challenge from both a business and a societal perspective, ensuring the success of our metropolis as one of the world's great cities to live and work in. Today, we continue to have many issues to discuss and work around, uh, particularly in the energy field, which is why we're so happy today to welcome the CEO of Toronto Hydro and uh, for, to do the second half of this introduction uh, and to introduce the man himself. I'm very uh, pleased to introduce you to Faisal Kazai, the Vice President of Energy for Siemens, who will carry on this intro. So thank you very much. So it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce Anthony Haynes today. So the Empire Club of Canada, as you all heard, has been recognized as one of Canada's oldest speakers' forums as it was established in 1903. Throughout the years, Empire Club has hosted many influential Canadian and international professionals, providing thought leadership from many industries. Today, you will have the opportunity to hear one of them, Anthony Haynes. So Anthony is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Toronto Hydro Corporation and its subsidies, which is one of the largest urban electricity distribution companies in Canada. He has 25 years of experience in the Canadian energy industry, including 15 years in various management positions in the natural gas industry. Anthony currently sits on the Ontario Energy Association Board of Directors and is the incoming chair for 2017. In addition, he served as chair of the Canadian Electricity Association from 2013 to 2015. Despite all his responsibilities, 
I'm quite impressed that he's actively involved in fundraising efforts for the Ross Tilly Burn Center at Sunnybrook Hospital. This is the largest and most advanced burn treatment center in Canada and is a leading researcher on electrical injury rehabilitation. Anthony is also the recipient of the Electricity Distributors Association's Chairs Citation Award, OEA's Leader of the Year, and Energy Council of Canada's 2014 Canadian Energy Person of the Year. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to give a warm welcome to Anthony Haynes. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for coming out to, to hear uh, a couple of comments from me today. Gord, that, that was a wonderful introduction to, uh, to the sector and to some of the issues we're going to be talking about today. And the piece I most appreciate about it, that I was reminded about some of our history of Toronto Hydro as you were giving some history of the industry, was a number of years ago, I was standing in our foyer, and in our foyer we have a niche, and there, inside that niche was a board book. It was the minutes of a board meeting that had happened roughly 100 years earlier. And I was standing around waiting for whatever I was off to do and got, got a chance to read these minutes. And the discussion that the board was having was whether they should refund the customer's bill for the month because the service was so bad. And so I'm pleased to say that you're, you know, the service has gone up. You didn't raise that as the example that you wanted to uh, put to me uh, this afternoon as to whether our service should be refunded or not. So I, so I appreciate the lovely context with which you start my comments. Anyway, it's truly a pleasure to be with you today. I'm going to, I suppose, spend 20 or 25 minutes uh, talking to you, and I hope that we'll be, have a chance to take a few questions at the end. Those that know me and have heard me talk before, you'll find that I tend to talk relaxed and without notes. And so there's something very unusual about my speech today, and that's because I come actually with some notes. And so I find that unusual, so I thought I'd comment on that. So why does Anthony have notes today? The, the reason is I want to start talking to you about changes that have been going on in our sector just this year alone. And I thought I had a pretty good memory, and I suddenly realized there were so many, I had to write them down. So maybe that is a good starting point for us to think about all the things that are going on in this, in this energy sector in Ontario. And so what I'm going to try to do with you is to put some context into them. Because as I sit back and I hear from my friends and family and neighbors and colleagues, everybody generally asks me the same question. How does this all fit together? Right? How does this all make sense? And there's been so many disparate pieces. So if you will, today's talk is going to be taking these pieces of the puzzle and seeing if we can link them together into a story about energy in Ontario. Right? So let's talk a little about just this year alone. Just this year, six months, in the electricity and natural gas industry in this province. We started the year, January 1st, with a rate increase, um, which is a fairly large rate increase, 6 7% for our customers. We'll talk about what that's all about. Then a month or so went by, and there was a report came out by a very official-looking group that said conservation programs are a total waste of money. That we're wasting billions of dollars because we're helping customers use energy more efficiently. A couple of weeks later, the Ontario Energy Board puts an announcement out about commodity price increases because we're not using enough electricity. Wait a minute. Aren't we doing, you trying to use less? Uh, but we're, in, we're just, I'm just halfway on my list. We have some rate increases. Toronto Hydro's rate increase for 15 gets done, but we're in 16. Then we have cap and trade comes along. What does that mean? How does that fit into the story? We're not even finished yet. So a month ago, document gets leaked. We're off of natural gas. We no longer like natural gas. This week, hang on a minute. We didn't mean natural gas is in natural gas. We kind of like natural gas. Maybe there has a place for it. And of course, now finally rumors of shuffles of ministries, cabinets, and and all the rest of it. So it's been kind of an interesting six months in the world that we live in. So how does all that make sense? How does it all fit together? So let's talk about that a little bit. I hope 
some of you in the back aren't going to be completely unable to see this, but I'll do my best. We cannot have a conversation about electricity in this province without talking about price, because it always ends up with price, doesn't it? So let, can we be candid? Price has been going up, okay? The price has roughly doubled in the last 10 years. I know you guys can't see this, so let me just tell you why for the students back there, although you guys are young, probably have good eyes. So. The yellow part is the commodity price. So that's the price of electricity that's generated that we all use. That has been the major contributor to price doubling, right? There's a piece up at the top there where new tax and policy regimes were being put in place. So let's just stop on these two points for a second and see if we can make sense of them. I want to talk about the first one, the introduction of an incentive program that came in force in January of this year, part of the reason for the increase I talked about. I actually agree with it. What it foundationally was doing was going from a system of rebate that we had that everybody got to one that was targeted for those that need it most. So as a policy matter, I think that's good policy. In other words, there are so many of us that are so blessed and don't need those kind of programs, but for those that do, that have a legitimate need, to reprioritize that into that form I think is a good idea. So let's talk about the commodity price. This journey really starts a decade ago when the announcement to get off coal happens. And you will remember some of the conversations at the time. In some ways, you'll probably remember them in the sense that you've read them in the newspaper in the last few days, because some of the same language is being repeated. But you'll recall that the conversation was, we have to do this as a, an imperative for our, for our uh, children and for our life that we had to simply get out of, a, out of the pollution that was being generated by coal. So remember the things that we talked about at the time? We said, okay, you're not gonna be able to do that because coal is necessary as a alternative to nuclear. In other words, they have different attributes we needed to fit inside there. It's low cost, it's in place now, and it's, a, and it's driving a major economic engine in this province with low cost electricity. Do you remember all that talk? So the impacts of that are in that yellow region. But I think in fairness, we have to also talk about the attributes associated with that. Do you know that the year of that announcement, that how many pollution warning days there were? I know some of you have heard me give this before. There was 32 that summer. In other words, 32 times that summer, we were advised as Ontarians not to go outside and breathe in. Do you know how many we had last year? Now you may say that's a quirk. Do you know how many we had the year before? So while there has been an increase in this policy, there have been some benefits that we all have to agree that we have realized. But there is a cost associated with it. So now we're talking about, okay, so we're targeting incentive programs for those that need them. We are cleaning up our, our fleet to have the environmental attributes that we want. But there's another side to that story, because we're just talking about price. But price doesn't mean that's how much your bill is, because it's price times consumption. So you know what's been going on with consumption on the average household? Consumption has gone down by one-third. Same houses. So what the conservation programs fundamentally do is they encourage you to get rid of an appliance before the end of its life. It may be in a light bulb, it may be a furnace, it may be windows, doors, and other things. But foundationally, what it's doing is it's saying, get rid of that stuff because it's costing you too much, we're going to help you do it. But there is the measure of success. It's often said to me, well, we've run, you know, it's back to this, oh, no, it's a waste of money. It's run its course. We've now achieved maximum available. So we looked at that. 
I'm going to point out that as a company with these smart meter programs, we have billions of pieces of data, right? And when you overlay where you do the programs, you get a profile of customers. And what you will find now is there's two kinds of customers, customers that have adopted change and customers that have resisted it. And the customers that have adopted change have brought their loads down, and the customers that have resisted it haven't. But the question is, have we reached the end of, this, of the journey? We know well now what the trending is, what the programs will deliver. And so I'm going to say to you that I think, on average, we're only halfway there. We actually have almost as far to go as we've traveled already. And so there are still massive opportunities ahead of us. All of that starts, though, with a customer who understands what's going on. Now, I hate to ask for a show of hands who understands their electricity bill, because um, I don't. Uh, and I guess if somebody should, I guess I should. Um, but it starts with information. Let's not use bill stuffers and bills to send out information. <laughs> right? It's done through a more dynamic relationship so customers can understand what they are doing and what impacts their life has on their bill. And that's largely the key to success around these programs. So I have to confess something to you. When uh, we started this journey roughly 10 years ago on conservation, we had a program, you know, these uh, pigtail light bulbs, the uh, low efficiency light bulbs. And of course, they are, are very well-meaning but misguided people showed up in my office and, and gave me a box of these things and said it was my social responsibility to go home and put them in my house, which I did, being, you know, sort of uh, doing what I told, I'm told to do. And they were awful. They were awful. There was that white light that made me think I was being interrogated. <laughs> there were, they burned out. They were supposed to be, you know, whatever. They last, you know, 10 years, and they burned out in 10 minutes. And I thought the most interesting thing about them was when I was selling that house, my realtor, you know, the realtors kind of come through and do a little walk around, and, they, and you know what they said? Get rid of those lights, they're lowering the value of your house. <laughs> the, remember, I just handed out like five million of them. So apparently I myself am doing my best to keep prices of real estate down in, uh, in Toronto. But the point being is they were so awful, I got turned off. So what happened? So here's my confession. So doing some lighting work on some lights that I can't reach and big pain and I gotta get somebody to come and do it and all this nonsense. And somebody says, well, you should use an LED light. Ah, you know, I've done it before, I hate this. And they actually showed me some bulbs. Unbelievable. The, you can now buy them by color bandwidth. You, you know, they meet any configuration. But you know the two things that really blew my mind when I used them? I got to read in the packaging, and I, oh yeah, you know, this thing uses 50 cents of electricity for the year, number one. And number two, and then maybe this is depressing for me, I realized that the light bulb was going to last longer than I was. They actually have, I don't know, 35,000 hours of life in them. And I started thinking, oh my goodness, my kids will change these light bulbs. I will never change this light bulb. My point being out of all of that, and it becomes relevant for us in a few minutes, is that I didn't change because there was an incentive and I got a coupon in the mail. The product changed, so it was the best thing for me. Right? It came and met me. I didn't go and meet it. Right? And that's what happened. And, and I'm thrilled by them. And they light when I turn the switch. It doesn't look like I have a wiring problem at home. And I have this little app, you know, I'm into, you know, your, your, your smart homes and all this kind of stuff. And I put them in my devices, and in my little app, it tells me how much energy I use. I could show you afterwards, but I'll show you my, my house without and with. I'd flip a light on, it'd be like 1,300 watts would be getting sucked out of the system. I change the light bulb, and it's like six watts. I thought there was a problem with the app. I thought it didn't, couldn't recognize the change in the technology. But in fact, that's what's going on. No change in functionality. I still turn the lights on, and I get light, and it's quality light. So my confession is that the market is moving. There are still massive opportunities ahead of us. So let's put these two things together quickly. Rates are going up. We got that. 
Consumption's going down. So what's the crossroads of all that? The media will leave you with that impression. Correct? Correct? When you, when you hear Toronto Hydro's rates went up by, you know, 1.7%, you think your bill's going to go up. But in actual fact, because of all of this, that's largely what's been happening. We as a city have been offsetting all of the new loads with conservation programs. That means when a tower 70 stories high gets brought onto the system, we've taken same volume off, right? That's what's going on underneath the water line. So everybody says, oh, you must be getting massive new revenues. Actually not true whatsoever. We're actually flat. The program has really been keeping up with pace. This is about to change, but that's what's been going on. So let's move forward now into energy policy in this province. Off a of coal. I talked about it, right? Wasn't going to work. Can't afford it. Needed the attribute. Policy needed to change there, and did change, and it's done. This becomes our greatest opportunity. Then we get building code. It's not just the conservation programs that are going on. The building is getting better. The equipment is getting better. The manufacturing techniques are getting better. All of that has been legislated its way through. So these things working in unison have really what's been driving that profile of the customer. What's been going on with Toronto? So this is such a cool slide. I love this slide. Can you guys see this back there? Because I want you to see. I'll do this a couple times. So that's Toronto 15 years ago. That's three years ago. I tried to get one. I couldn't quite get the right angle. You can't see the Rogers Center anymore. So, can I go back? There we are. That is in... 10 years. That's what's going on with the city. That is the service that we are trying to provide without adding any infrastructure so, to support it. Right? We're, we've been able to achieve that largely through conservation programs. So we move on. And we say, OK, we have a colliding now of environment and energy. I personally think the two will never be pulled apart again, or should be pulled apart. You cannot talk about energy without talking about the environment. Fair? And when we look at the distribution of where the carbon is produced, two things, heating and fuel now, uh, transportation, gasoline. So these become our next challenges, right? And they're huge challenges. So what does it say about what was the saying that about change? Who's, who are the only people that like change? Do you remember this one? The only people that like change are wet babies. <laughs> we resist change as adults, right? It's our nature to feel comfortable in our, in our place that we currently stand. And so change is hard. We should recognize it. It's more about change management than it is about technology management. So, do we have a wet diaper? Are we ready for change again? Or would we like to hold our ground and take a pause? I think that's the question that Ontario is asking itself now. And what are the consequences? But the thing that I want to be careful about criticizing or being careful not to criticize is the language I read in the newspaper around the question of the, of the footprint with natural gas was exactly the same discussion and language that was used around coal. So it, it, well, we need it because it's a fuel that makes sense when you have electricity. It's a great offsetting fuel. It's a low-cost choice, right? Uh, these were foundationally the same language. But there's one fundamental difference. We're the consumer, right? We're, it's at the other end of the system, not at the top end of the system that we were largely indifferent to. So there is a foundational difference. I get that. But the question is, how does this policy fit into place? So let's start talking about that for a second. Natural gas. What should we do with natural gas? There's a draft 
leaked report out there that says it should be banned by legislation. Do we think that's a good strategy or not? So let's talk about these pieces that are going on here. Cap and trade. Do you guys know what cap and trade does? It puts a price tag on pollution, right? Why do you need a price tag on pollution? Because the fuel that these fuels have got such abundance now, the pricing is so low that you will not get fuel switching by natural economics. So what you try to do is you put a price into it to reflect the footprint that, that, that it produces, right? So how do you avoid paying that? You can go off, you can do one of two things. You can buy a credit, a pollution credit from somebody who has one, so they did some work and they get a credit and they sell it to me and I get to go continue on polluting. Or I do some work myself and I reduce my, my pollution, right? That's kind of how the cap and trade works. And there's a great conversation going on because we here in Ontario have linked together with the model from Quebec and, and California. And so is that the right linkage, I think is the foundational question. And there's a criticism that what's going to happen here of this $2 billion a year, which will be basically taxed into the model, where will that money go? There is no doubt in my mind that it leaves Ontario. Right? Most of it will go to California. The question I have is, is that a bad thing or not? For, you know, certainly as an Ontarian and Torontonian, I would have to say yes. But we have to step back and look at the objective that we're trying to achieve here. The objective is an environmental one. And is the environment a local issue or a global issue? I think is the question that it needs to be answered. I, I have this very crass way of describing this, so I apologize for anybody I'm about to offend. But it, to me, it's like the question of you know, peeing, or swimming in the no peeing end of the pool, right? Can you really achieve that objective? Well, of course you can't. So is it so bad that we achieve an, a global environmental improvement regardless of where it is? It doesn't matter if it's in the, your end of the pool or the other end of the pool as long as it's achieved globally. So I'm not as fussed, putting aside the economics of a billion, billion and a half dollars leave in this province, I'm not as fussed about that if we accept that everybody's got to get on the system, right? In other words, there must not be winners and losers associated with that model. Fuel switching, natural gas, hey, this is going to be the, the, this is the question of the century as far as I'm concerned. Natural gas on a peak day produces, from an energy point of view, three, four times what our electric grid produces. It's a, you know, it's a high capital investment industry. It's a lot like the, the electricity grid, and the assets are in place, and it's working, and it's working magnificently. And so the question is, is it going to be outlawed? Is it going to be an orderly transition? Does it have some applications that make sense and some that don't? You know, I will observe in my neighborhood oil trucks delivering oil to furnaces. Wow, we're worried about natural gas. <laughs> have you seen Bunker C oil? Those, you know, that's that stuff down at the bottom that you know, we pave our roads with. That's going up the chimney. So there's no question that there are opportunities even within our own environment locally to, that we can still do good work in a natural gas environment. There is no question when we think about our, the distant communities in this province who are burning diesel fuel, uh, natural gas can play such a critical role. There's no question that natural gas is a feedstock for many important uh, industries, right? And so it's an employer here that we cannot turn our back on. And not, not to make excuses, but this program, whatever program we have, has got to be orderly. So I would propose that it should be voluntary. Because when you get a voluntary incentive-based program, it will find its natural economic equilibrium, right? And so I think it's the right policy. It just needs a little tweaking. I'm going to just spend a couple more minutes with you on transportation. So did you see the Tesla 3? Uh, you know, I, I gather there are almost 500,000 orders now. Um, just to give you a sense of that, the biggest plants in you know, GM produce less than half of that number of volume. I mean, that's 
And that happened in roughly a week. But you know what's really, really interesting that I'm having some, some fun watching? When you look at what happened in the social media with this thing, it was the most successful product launch in global history. And they didn't even have a product. <laughs> like, there is some genius inside there. You know, you know, because you know, those that have ever spent marketing dollars, you know, you get this how many hits you got, and you're, you know, it's all fluffy stuff. They must be going crazy looking at the graphs, right? It had more hits than the iPhone when it was launched, right? A, a, an electric car, right? An electric car got more hits. So for a week-long period, it basically monopolized the social media. But you, here's where I become a sort of an analytical nerd. Do you know what they were talking about? They were talking about the affordability of the thing, the excitement about it, things like that. So there's a major piece that wasn't on there that surprised me when I looked at this data. Because something had changed. Do you know what's not there when you think about the electric car? It's going to be interesting to see if anybody comes up with this here. So five years ago when we started our electric car program, we actually had a program where if your battery went dead while you were driving, we would come and pick you up. Okay? And then we'd haul your car to a charger. You know how many times we used it? Zero. So there's your hint. Do you see anything on there about range? It's gone out of the discussion of the electric car. So there was no discussion about the range of the thing. It was about the affordability of the thing. We've just had a, an event, a, an elasticity event for those, uh, those economists in the room. We just found where price crosses over, right? So why is that? What we know when we look at the electric car in Toronto being used for years is massive savings, right? I, I gave a, a little talk looking at these differences, about a thousand dollars difference between a gasoline car and an electric car in annual operating costs. If you bought an electric car, you would displace three quarters of your electricity bill. You would offset three quarters of your electricity bill if you just bought an electric car. So I want to go back to my question that I raised, or my comments I raised with you about my LED light bulb. Does this feel a little like that? When we started off on this journey, it was the smart car, right? And you know, it was like a driving a you know, sewing machine. Um, you know, had no range. You know, and let's face it, you know, at least as a guy, there was no women looking at me driving my smart car. <laughs> so, but now we have this beautiful new model, priced effectively and appropriately, massive savings and massive social benefit, right? Isn't that what I just described with the LED light bulb? It's all those attributes just playing themselves out something on four wheels. So I think we will never look back at this moment. We'll never look back from, from this moment because this will be their, this is our future. So that's, forget the numbers, it doesn't really matter. There's the sales in Toronto. You pick whatever numbers you want. <laughs> How do they charge? One of the things that Toronto is quite unique about is a huge volume of us as, you know, as a group of people, we have a, a huge volume that, of people that have a parking place, an individual private parking spot, either a garage, you know, pad, a, a condo, et cetera. That makes us a bit unique in the world. So our, th our thinking is it's going to be about 80% charged at home, meaning that you're more likely to just come home at night and plug it in. We actually know now that people generally park and plug about once a week. So that whole anxiety of, you know, coming home every day and having to go through that, gone. It's history. So, but there's got to be multiple solutions. The volumes on these things when they plug in are through the roof, right? 
bit techy, but the level three chargers now that some of the people are asking for in their homes, right, um, charge the Tesla in half an hour. If you, you know, of course all their neighbors' houses dim, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it's sort of like instantaneously putting a couple more houses on the grid, you know, between you and your neighbor, right? And, and so the charging is advancing. But we know, the thing we know about it is it happens at the same time as the peak in your house, right? So you come home, you plug in, you go in the house, turn the dryer on, turn the range on, turn the TV on. So I don't know if you're like me, but I think, what does the mayor, Tory, call it an integrated transit strategy? I think they had the latest announcement today. So I'm going to change the name of it, the integrated electric transit strategy. But that's what it is. All of those pieces, I think the little pink piece, the relief line got announced today. So on top of all these cars, there's the grid that's getting built. And these are huge loads. So let's talk honestly about our capacity as an industry to deliver a solution. I think the general consensus is that we are just idling and we have so much capacity, just plug it in, right? This is all coming at no cost. So let's talk about that. So let me explain this complicated graph. Um, the white part is how consumption looks in Toronto on a 24-hour period. So it's got a curve to it. If you look at that curve 10 years ago, it would be very spiky. Now, through our programs, we've levelized it to a sort of a nice wave, right? In other words, we've lowered the peak and raised the valley. But what we've also done, as I described earlier, is we've lowered the consumption overall. So you see the blue? That's the capacity that's in our system generally. Yeah, it's not exact, so don't, you know, with those people that are from the OEB or something, don't get cranked about my evidence here, but it, there's capacity in the system is the point. The green, though, and do you see how we had to get, cut the green because the scale wouldn't work? The green foundationally is the big question, and it basically says if we move to any kind of concentration of vehicles and home heating or heat pumps or other programs, we will conservatively go between three and four times the throughput on the system. So what I can tell you is our system doesn't sit at 25% capacity today, right? I'm sure that's not a surprise to you. This is actually a graphic of our distribution system. This is in our evidence. There's 36 stations, transformation stations. Um, and what the green is, is we've got enough capacity, sort of normal life um, over the next 10 years. The yellow is, eh, we're getting some problems. The red is dream on. Assuming no electric vehicles and no conversion of fuel from natural gas. So, do you think that's a good working assumption? And the question is, how much is it going to cost? Listen, I haven't had people work the numbers because it's somewhat irrelevant at this point, but I think it's fair to say we will add numbers by fives and six billions at a go. In other words, the cost to rebuild the backbone and the big delivery stations in the city will be enormous. Because you will, we have stations, all the stations are largely reaching 100%. So if you've got to add four times, even with good management of loads and charging cars at night and all of those good things, at the, very, very quickly you will simply run out of capacity. And so you will have to go through a substantial building program. And it'll take a long time. You know, we've got, I think one of our, uh, our executives said to me the other day, or reminded me the other day, that our wires cross Canada five times, right? And so if two-thirds of those need to be changed, you can start doing the arithmetic. So it's a massive job ahead of us. And, I, and it's my job to do that job. But my point about it all is that it should not be missed in the conversation, that there is no free lunch on this solution, and that we therefore have to be very measured in the way that we, and the speed with which we, we move here. 
So what's the answer? I always get the, you know, everybody likes the mouse trap and, and stuff. The answer is all of the above. There will be no single mousetrap that will work. There will be no one solution that will dominate. It must be a, a, must be a series of every single piece it has to be brought forward in unison at the right time to make this thing work. It's going to be a little precarious, to say the least. I know many of you here are from this industry. So let me tell you this, candidly. I know when you think about this industry, you put that picture in your mind, because we love that picture, don't we? Oh, you have generators, and they're little boxes, and you have big wires, and they're on towers. Like, we love that stuff. You couldn't be more wrong. That is so old world thinking. So my encouragement to us all, and including me, is get that model out of your head. Because what you've got to start thinking about is a new way of delivering energy that is different than we've thought about before. Energy comes in at different points, goes out at different points, is stored at different points, fuels will be used differently, and all of it will be controlled by the customer. I can go on my phone right now and turn lights on and off and air conditioners on and off. My choice. Or I can have, in my case, Rogers do it for me through an algorithm. Right? I'm controlling the grid at my house. And so I want us to stop thinking about this industry as a straight line and start thinking about it as a web, a virtual environment that we're going to have to adapt around to make all of these pieces fit. So let me see if I can make sense of all this policy then. And I will admit that I feel a little like I'm taking these jigsaw puzzle pieces, in some cases hitting them a little harder than the puzzle maker intended. But I do think that there is a context here that's important. So let's think about what's been going on. We've helped the people that are most needed. Tick. Conservation is working and worth every penny. In fact, arguably, it's not what the report said that it costs $2 for every dollar of value. It's actually the other way around, if not more. So conservation's working. Yes, we're building out our grid, and there's new investments going on, but we see the attributes and the benefits associated with it. Particularly, you can go outside right now and breathe. Cap and trade, we're going to have to get used to the fact that we can't swim in the no-peeing end of the pool. Right? That's just a reality of that's what the problem is. It's a global problem. It's not a local problem. We've got to be very careful about fuel switching because we could trip ourselves up in trying to get to something too quick, but it's probably the right direction. So that's my attempt at putting it all together in the pieces. I don't know if, honestly, there's a mastermind, you know, sitting thinking these policies through and it actually works that way. Nah, probably not. But at the end of the day, I can actually understand that it actually can make some sense, and it's a vision. The question I'm going to leave you with, are we wet? Do we feel, are we up for the change, or are we going to resist it? And so I've been saying to so many of us in the industry, adapt or die. So I, for one, want to accept that I'm wet, and change will be OK, and so we'll welcome it. But we have to be very careful as we move through these stages, because there's going to be no free lunch, and there's going to be some struggles with it. So thank you very much for your attention. Happy to take some questions. Thanks very much, Anthony. Um, by the way, we're just working on getting uh, Elon Musk right now at the club, and I made a mental note. We have to get you sitting beside him when he comes. <laughs> Um, I think the, the uh, organizers just told me we have either time for one complex question or two, two simple questions. So um, there's, there's some roving mics at the back, this young lady here. 
So if anyone has a question, just raise your hand and we'll do our best to get it to Anthony. What? Here, just wait for the mic here. Does that mean that I can give a complex or a simple answer to the question? <laughs> yeah, it's a, I think it's a simple question, hopefully. So uh, I saw your future load projections and you talked about uh, e uh, electro uh, electrical cars. Have you also considered data centers in that? Because with the big data and the increase in data transmission, yeah. uh, that, and these data centers have big loads. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's obviously in this new economy, there's all kinds of new applications. Um, data centers are absolutely one that we need to coordinate around. Um, but it's not just data centers, for sure. Some new ap applications that are coming into society have huge volumes associated with it. Toronto is obviously a, an area where there's a lot of data centers. And uh, so, yes, you know, we do, we do long-term planning, you know, sort of 20-year stuff. Uh, to make sure we're ready for that. But it's part of what's driving some of those green to red, you know, to yellow to red. Okay. Um, those systems are coming on now. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Thank you. Last question? None of them dare ask. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to invite, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite Todd Williams from Navigant to express our collective appreciation. Todd. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> uh, can I keep these? Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Anthony, for a very captivating and uh, entertaining sort of discussion through uh, policy. I'm glad you brought your notes today uh, because there has been a lot of change. And uh, actually, both your remarks and Gordon's remarks reminded me uh, back to 1903, that's a bit before my time, but that reminded me of uh, the, the ongoing sort of policy discussion and debate that we have in this province about electricity. It's sort of near and dear to everyone's hearts, and uh, certainly, in a way, that has not changed. Um, Anthony also reminded me, uh, and I think all, a lot of us, about uh, how things change and how the market is driving a lot of things. CFL to LEDs, for example. The change in sort of debate, the, the discussion about what is a Tesla versus, say, a smart car? All of those uh, reinforce, in my mind, kind of how the market is driving change and also how the, uh, how the industry has to respond. The fact that we have uh, discussion now about cap and trade, comparing that, say, with the discussion about coal, obviously things are different. Obviously that discussion has to go on uh, for a number of years. Um, Anthony, you mentioned what I would call, what we call a navigate, the energy cloud, the whole thing about sort of everything being all connected. That is, in our view, the biggest change in the industry in over 100 years, and it is coming a lot faster than a lot of us think. So uh, I don't know if I'm wet or dry, but I'm certainly uh, ready for the change. So on behalf of the Empire Club and uh, everyone here, I would like to thank you for joining us today to uh, share your thoughts, pull together your notes, and try to connect all this together for us. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Todd. And by the way, thank you to Siemens and Navigant for being our event sponsors and making today possible. I'd also like to thank the National Post, which is our, our print uh, sponsor, and of Rogers Television, our local broadcaster. I'd also be remiss if I did not thank MediaEvents.ca, which is Canada's online event space for live webcasting and podcasting today's events. And as I'm sure all of you know, that's how most people now actually see Empire Club events. Uh, thank you to everyone for being here today. We want to uh, please follow us on Twitter, uh, Empire underscore Club. You can also follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And uh, we've got some great events coming up between now and the end of our season, which is at the end of June. Uh, tomorrow, for example, we have the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, Beverly McLaughlin, who will be joining us in this very room to talk about the importance of keeping Canada's judicial system independent of government. wonder where that topic came from. Um, and uh, that'll be very interesting. If anyone wants to buy a ticket to that, by the way, there still are some tickets left, so make sure to order this afternoon. And we also have Premier Brad Wall, one of the big uh, major conservative voices in the country right now from Saskatchewan, who will be here on June 14th, also in this very room. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attendance today. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.